Oh, that's good. Okay. Oh yeah, numbers jumping up. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and go on mute now. Shazad, I'm getting a message that it looks like the chat is disabled. Can you please check? I do show it as active. Excellent. Let's go ahead and get started then. Okay. It's now 2 p.m. Mountain Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this informative webinar on conflict de-escalation. I'm Christy Denbrock, the Chief Learning Officer here at NEHA. Before I introduce you to our speaker, Alicia Love, I would like to encourage you to become a NEHA member if you are not already. Additional information is available on our website. And after the webinar, we ask that you please take a moment and fill out the survey that will be posted in the chat box. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce 
Alicia Love. Alicia is the chief of the Meat, Milk, and Egg Inspection Bureau for the Montana Department of Livestock. Her expertise is in food safety and inspections with varied experience in retail and manufacturing. Alicia earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Applied Biology from the Arizona State University, and she holds a Master's of Public Health from Grand Canyon University. Please place your questions into the chat box, and we will address them at the end of her presentation. So again, thank you all for joining us. And Alicia, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, this is a training that I've developed for my inspection personnel, and I am hoping that you will all find it beneficial too. So let's start with a question. When someone says conflict, what comes to your mind? And this is just something that you can think about on your own for a moment here. So generally, when people say the word conflict, we have a fairly negative connotation of what we're thinking about. So it's a fight or disagreement or you think of anger, but conflict is an inevitable part of life. Um, we experience conflict at work, at home, even in recreational settings, but whether the conflict is a negative thing or not really is dependent on is it a constructive way to try and exchange information and figure something out, or is it not constructive? And unfortunately for us as regulators, conflict is very normal. Um, we have to uphold these regulations and the entities that we regulate have to comply with those regulations while balancing their wants and needs and their own challenges. So everyone here has heard about the fight or flight response. Um, we've heard this phrase, we've experienced it. So on a biological level, it is a rapid release of hormones that is preparing you for a threat. Um, you will have an, a, a, the sensation of your heart starting to race or your breath becoming erratic. You might start to tremble or sweat, your, your pupils get dilated. And this adaptation was great when we really needed that rush of hormones to deal with very serious threats. We needed to be able to actually escape or face these dangers. But in more modern times, this adaptation isn't as useful. So the fight response is going to look like aggressive language, um, you might become angry when you think about the altercation, and it can also result in people offering extreme solutions to their problems. So, you know, you're talking to your boss and you get upset and you say, I quit, when that's not really going to solve this issue. In rare cases, it can result in physical violence. Unfortunately, the flight response is equally unhelpful here. So, when we have the flight response, we avoid the situation permanently. We get out of it and we're not gonna go back to it no matter what. Um, we might talk about it to other people about the fact that it's bothering us, but we don't really want to resolve it. Um, this often is construed as that kind of passive aggressive behavior that we've seen with others. And in some cases we become fearful or uncomfortable when we're reflecting on this. Unfortunately, neither of these situations help us in modern times. These don't help us work through having a disagreement with a spouse or partner or not agreeing with a coworker about something. So thankfully there are some tools that can help us manage this. The first tool is emotional intelligence. 
And that is generally defined as just the ability to perceive, control, and evaluate your emotions. So this means that you're able to identify your emotions and you're aware of how your emotions impact those around you. You're able to regulate these emotions. Um, you have a measured response when something does occur that is appropriate. And you're also able to stay in control of what your values are. You don't make rushed decisions. Next is going to be the motivation. So that's working towards your goals and being reflective on past events and wanting to improve upon them if they didn't go well for you. Empathy, I think, is the one that most people think of when we talk about emotional intelligence. So you're able to relate to others. You can put yourself in their shoes and say, if I was in that situation, this is how I would feel. And last but not least is those social skills. So the way you communicate to others about how you're feeling or what your wants and needs are, how you relate to them when you talk to them, and being able to give praise and give recognition to their efforts. Emotionally intelligent people are super easy to recognize. They're people that are easy to work with. Um, they don't hold grudges. You don't wonder where you stand with them. So an emotionally intelligent person is someone you can say, hey, I think you made a mistake and they can reflect on it and say, you know what, you're right, I did. I take ownership for that. Here's how I'm going to change going forward. Um, and there's someone that's just very transparent about where they're at with you. Oftentimes, people will mistake empathy and emotional intelligence for being a pushover, and that's not actually correct. So a truly emotionally intelligent person has boundaries that they can stick to, but they can communicate those boundaries in an effective and polite manner. So for example, hey, I need you to cover my shift tomorrow. I'm so sorry, I would normally be able to do that, but I have a commitment. Is there something else I can do to help you? That's the sound of an emotionally intelligent person. Next up is our circle of control. And this is an important thing to couple with emotional intelligence. There are so many things in the world that we worry about that give us a lot of angst or we spend a lot of time on, but really there's only a little bit that we can control. So first up is the circle of no concern. These are things that we don't have any control over. So the weather, construction, the outcome of a sports game, these are things that we care about, but we can't control them directly. So all we can do in the circle of no concern is prepare for it. If we know it's going to rain, grab an umbrella. If you know that road is going to be under construction, maybe go a different route or leave a few minutes earlier. The next one is the circle of influence. So again, these are not things that you have direct control over, but we can influence it. So the example I love to use here is if I want to be friends with someone at work, maybe I try to talk to them during breaks or I invite them to social events or I just ask them how their day is. And that person might reflect on how I'm behaving towards them and say, Alicia seems like a nice person. I would like to be friends with her. I would like to go to the farmer's market with her this weekend. Or they might say, Alicia's really odd and she talks to me a lot and I don't really wanna be her friend. It's not in my control but my behaviors and actions influence that. So that leaves truly our circle of control, which is your actions, your behaviors, your words, your work ethic. That's really the only thing that you have complete control of. So now that we have these tools in mind, what happens when we get into a conflict? Um, we often don't recognize that a situation is escalating. It might start with that kind of gut feeling that something doesn't seem right, but maybe we don't say, hey, there's something happening right now. So what are some other cues that we can look for? 
start by looking at how the interaction is going. Is there a sudden change in body language or in tone? Um, through this presentation, I tend to use my hands quite a bit to add emphasis to my expressions. If I suddenly were to put my hands in my pocket or cross my arms, that'd be a good indication that something has changed between us. Um, when I give this presentation in person, I tend to move around the room quite a bit. I make a lot of eye contact. So if I suddenly were to just stand at the, at the front of the room and stop looking at people, that would be another good sign that something has happened between us. But there's also some really obvious ones here, right? Clenching of the fists, clenching of the jaw, yelling, name calling, actively defying you know, what you're saying. Those are some good signs too that something's going on. So now that we know that the conflict exists, we know we need to get things back under control. So you wanna start with yourself. Do some introversion on how is the communication? Are you starting to raise your voice at this person or is your voice level? Um, are you making a lot of kind of confrontation, confrontational statements like, hey, you're messing up or are you using a lot of I statements? And how is your body language? Are you clenching your jaw or clenching your fists? Are you crossing your arms? Um, a lot of studies have shown that most of our communication is nonverbal. So for that body language and tone, what message are you sending outside of the words that you're saying? You also want to be mindful of your breathing. Does your breathing feel measured or are you starting to feel your heart race? And are you giving that other person space or are you like right there next to them in their face? And is your response accurate or over-exaggerated? Um, a term that we deal with quite a bit is emotional dysregulation. So that's an emotional response that's poorly modulated and it's not an acceptable response to what's happening. When we experience dis emotional dysregulation, it's oftentimes easy for other people to see that we're dysregulating, but we may not always notice it in the moment. Let's take a look. Alicia, we're having trouble hearing the video. Is there a way we can have that uh, volume be turned up? And could we start it over, please? Sure. Thank you. This is Oh, wow. Get my mind off the way. 
We're still not hearing any audio on the video. All right, let's give this. Let me try one more thing. I apologize, everyone. Let me try. I think I know what I need to do. Give me just a moment here, folks. Thank you for letting me know. We're still not hearing audio, Alicia. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and just move along then. I apologize, folks. Um, <clears throat> So in that particular scenario, what I was trying to demonstrate is that that character was upset about having to buy a disproportionate number of hot dogs versus hot dog buns and the interaction between him and the grocery store staff was not going well. So um, for those of you who are familiar with the movie, The Father of the Bride, that's a familiar scene. Um, for those of you who are not, it's just a good example of emotional dysregulation. So um, emotional dysregulation is something that everyone experiences at times. It's one of those things that um, oftentimes when we have a series of things not going well for us, and then you kind of have that breaking point where you just kind of lose control of your emotions. So it's a very normal human behavior, it happens. Um, but if it's happening a lot and frequently, um, it's a good sign that perhaps you need to do some reflection on how you're regulating those emotions when you're under a lot of stress. So once you've identified that a conflict is happening, um, you want to try and remove yourself from the situation if you feel like you're starting to lose control. So if your breathing is rapid, you're starting to sweat, maybe your heart is starting to pound, it's a good sign that it's time to step away temporarily. So in regulation, this feels hard. You know, we're there to try and make sure we're keeping control of what's going on. But it might sound something like, hey, this is starting to feel like we're both getting frustrated. Let's take a couple of minutes to regroup and we'll gather our thoughts and then try to figure this out. So once you've removed yourself from the person you're in conflict with, you want to start by getting that breathing back under control and kind of taking back the reins on that release of hormones that you're experiencing. So a very easy way to do this is a breathing technique that I've learned. And essentially what you do is you wanna take a really big deep breath in. You're going to hold that breath in and count to three, one, two, three. Then you're going to push it out slowly. One, two, three, hold it out for three, back into three. And you can repeat that as many times as you need um, so that you can kind of just get that breathing and that heart rate back to more of a steady place for you. And while you're doing that, you don't want any other thoughts to be coming into your head. You want to just really be focusing on that breathing and that counting. I've been in a number of different situations where I've been fairly stressed out and it's surprising how fast I can get back to that kind of calm center by doing that. Um, I will say that in doing that counting and not letting other things come into your mind, that that can take some practice. And so if you find that that is a hard thing for you to do, you may want to just occasionally practice doing this in a non, you know, in a non-stressful time. 
and just kind of build that muscle of, nope, I'm letting those thoughts go right now. I'm letting that go right now. I'm not thinking about that. I'm focusing on my counting right now. So if you're able to do that, it's quite beneficial. Once your breathing starts to feel more normal, then it's time to reflect on the situation. So you want to evaluate what happened with only the facts and without trying to assign blame. Um, this can be a hard thing to do. Often when we're feeling emotionally charged, it's hard to look at things with neutrality, but you want to try and find a just very black and white, this is what happened. Um, in the case of a moment ago, I was having a conflict with my speaker system. I couldn't figure out why that wasn't working for me. The experience that I was, the emotions that I was experiencing were uncertainty and nervousness. And how can my conflict be resolved? I chose to move on past this video and try to explain the situation without that visual aid. So it's a good way to just kind of reflect on it, take notes if you need to. Um, some other things you might want to think on is if you are angry, you know, what's kind of fueling behind that? Are you afraid that something is happening that you don't like? Are you losing something like you're losing control of a situation? Um, and what are some ways that the conflict could be resolved? Now that you feel calmer and you have some ideas about what is going on and maybe what needs to happen next, prepare yourself to continue the discussion. Ask the, the other party if they are ready to talk about it. Now, if they say no, respect that. You guys now have tools in your toolkit to get to calm, to think about it and be ready to go back in. The person you're in conflict with may not be ready yet. So if they say no, we're not gonna leave the situation alone. We're gonna get this resolved. Say, okay, I understand. Could I come back in 10 minutes? Could I come back before I am done with the inspection? Could we maybe talk about this in the morning? You know, try and get them to commit to a timeline of when you can talk about what's going on. Once they say that they are ready to talk, you need to look at your surroundings for a number of reasons. First up is you want to make sure you don't have an audience when you're trying to do de-escalation with someone else. People are very curious, and if they have other employees or members of the public around while you're trying to do this, they might start to feel self-conscious. So try to find an area that's not really in the pathway where you can get kind of a spectator show going. You also want to make sure that if you're in a smaller space, you're not visually blocking them from exiting. So if you're standing in an office, for example, don't position yourself right in front of the door because that's going to get that fight or flight response going with that person again, because they will feel trapped. You want to make sure that your language is calm. You wanna have a nice level voice. You don't wanna be yelling, of course, but it's also important to be using I phrases. I feel like something happened today. I feel like I saw this. Instead of you statements. You statements tend to get people feeling very defensive very quickly. And the focus of the conversation can become, I'm going to protect myself instead of I'm going to resolve this with you. You want to ensure that your body language is neutral. So ideally you would like your arms to be kind of loosely at your side with your palms out towards them. You certainly don't wanna have your arms crossed or in your pocket. Um, of course, avoiding things like tapping your foot or rolling your eyes. Those are definitely very strong language that say, I'm not interested in this or I don't like this. You wanna make sure that you're showing genuine empathy. It's not uncommon when you're doing conflict resolution for people to want to vent, and that is okay. I do put some caveats on venting, um, abusive language, threats, yelling, those are not acceptable for venting. But venting could sound like, 
I'm upset that this happened and this is going to slow down my work or this is going to cause me to have to do this and that's hard for me. It's okay for them to get those feelings out. That's perfectly acceptable here. Once they have all of that kind of laid out, ask for solutions. Say, hey, I understand that I had to take a regulatory control action today. What do you think we can do to get you up and operational again? Or what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? And show them that you want to get the problem solved together. Um, if they are giving suggestions that maybe aren't really going to work, that's okay. You don't want to immediately say, no, that's not going to work because then it's going to be combative again. So consider it and see if there's a piece of that solution that you can integrate. So you can say something like, I like your focus on this. Can we build on that idea? Um, it's also important when they're thinking about these solutions to accept silence. For many people, silence is a very uncomfortable thing. And so we tend to try to talk through that silence, but that doesn't really let the other person reflect on what you're trying to solve. And last but not least is don't always expect immediate answers. The person may say, hey, I need to talk to another person about this, or I need to think about this. And we're going to accept that. But again, we're not going to just let it go. If they say, I need to talk to another person about this, you might say, may I follow up with you on that tomorrow then? We definitely want to make sure that we're not allowing them to exit the conflict permanently. We want to make sure we're committing to coming back to it. There are some situations where conflict resolution and de-escalation are not appropriate. So if someone is threatening to assault you or is name calling, that is not an appropriate time to de-escalate. Um, personal safety is paramount. And so that's not an appropriate time to do that. All right, so here's some thoughts. Um, I do have some scenarios that I want people to kind of work on independently, um, but professional and respectful conduct is everyone's responsibility, especially as regulators. You know, we need to make sure that we are kind of the calming force when we're dealing with conflict in a professional setting, regardless of how the other person's behaving. We need to remember that conflict is normal, especially in a regulatory capacity. And we need to be able to identify when conflict is becoming unproductive. I encourage folks that if you are a program manager or an HR person to have some policies in place on how to keep people safe when conflict is happening, um, with my own staff, the expectation is that if they do not feel safe, the expectation is that they leave the facility and call their supervisor right away. I also ask that they write down what happened with as much detail as they can. So times, who was involved, direct quotes of what was said. Um, the program that I manage, we do have um, policies in place where we can close plants that are not safe for our inspectors and we will not return there until the plant has developed a safety plan or corrective action that will ensure my staff are safe to return to that location. So the next series of slides are just going to describe some different scenarios so we can kind of practice what we've talked about so far. I'm going to give everyone a few moments to read and think about these, and then I can give you some sample answers of what's been discussed in the past. All right, so the first scenario, your coworker calls you and says they feel you are not doing your job correctly. As the discussion progresses, you recognize that they're starting to talk louder and faster. They also seem to be thinking less about your responses and are talking over you. 
So here are some questions for you to consider. Is the interaction escalating? How do you know? What next steps do you think should be taken? And what should you be mindful of about yourself? So we'll give everyone just a moment to reflect on this. All right, um, this interaction, interaction is definitely escalating. And as you probably guessed, you know that because they are starting to talk louder, they're talking over you. Um, this interaction has turned less into let's have a conversation and more, I'm just gonna tell you what you're not doing right. So the next step should probably be something like removing yourself from the situation and saying something like, I need some time to think about what you're saying. Can I call you later? Or could I meet you at the office or meet you at an establishment so we can talk about this in person? Um, or maybe would you be willing to send me your concerns in an email and I can call you and follow up with you on what they are at a later date? So that's going to give them some time to kind of calm back down from whatever's bothering them. And it also gives you time to process what they're saying without being in the conflict with that person. You need to be mindful when you're telling them that you're going to hang up, you know, we're not gonna use that you language. We're gonna say, hey, I need some time to regroup on this. And you wanna make sure when they do tell you what they believe you're doing wrong, that you're receptive to hearing it, and if you are in fact making a mistake, being accountable to it, if you're not making a mistake, just trying to keep that conversation positive, saying things like, I appreciate your concern about this. I feel that I'm doing it correctly for this reason. Um, so those are some ways that you could tackle this. So the next scenario, you arrive at a restaurant for an inspection. During your observations, you see an employee pick up a knife that they dropped on the floor and resume using it without washing. You bring this to the owner's attention and they begin yelling that you are lying and out to get them. You notice that they are standing very close to you and they keep clenching their fists. So this is going to be the same type of questions that we had in the first one. Is the interaction escalating? How do you know? What are your next steps? And what are you mindful of? All right, so I think most of us agree that this interaction certainly is escalating. Um, you know, because the owner's accusing you of lying, they're yelling at you, they're standing close to you and clenching their fists. So the next step that should be taken, you're going to take a big step backwards. Ideally, when we're trying to talk to people, we want to be about a foot and a half to three feet away from them. So far enough away that we're not in each other's business, but not so far away that the only way we can talk to each other is by shouting. Um, so taking a big step back and we don't want to say, I'm not lying, you're lying, or you know, that's not going to help this. So something that you could say is, why do you think I'm lying? Why would you believe that I'm out to get you? And that kind of opens them up to perhaps expressing their concerns about what you're doing. Um, some other good suggestions that I've gotten for this particular situation is asking the employee if they dropped the knife or asking another employee if they saw the knife get dropped, um, just kind of going for an information gathering session. Um, 
as a regulator, this accusation of wanting to close plants is unfortunately something I hear commonly. And what I like to say when things are a little bit calmer is if I closed everywhere that I inspected, I wouldn't have anything to do and I wouldn't have a job. So I have a vested interest in your business staying open, but I also have a vested interest in making sure that food safety is preserved. All right, third scenario. You observe that a deli slicer is not clean during an inspection. You bring it to the attention of the manager. He rolls his eyes and walks away. A few minutes later, an employee comes over and starts cleaning the slicer. Later on, you see a different employee not wash their hands correctly. You find the same manager. While you explain the situation, he keeps his hands on his hips you notice he is tapping his foot impatiently. After you finish speaking, he asks you if you are done. You say yes, and he walks off again. So is this interaction escalating? How do you know? What next steps would you take? And what should you be mindful of about yourself? All right, so this scenario tends to be a little bit tricky for people when I give this training because it doesn't really feel like it's escalating, but it is very much that passive aggressive kind of flight response to conflict that we talked about earlier. Unfortunately, this does need to get addressed. So the next steps that I would take in this scenario is to perhaps talk to the manager before I leave for the day and say, I noticed today that you seem frustrated when I brought some problems to your attention. Is there a different way that you would like me to bring those things to your attention? Is there perhaps you know, a different manager that should be handling these things and you're not the appropriate person to talk to about these concerns? Um, I like to use this example too, to remind people that we can be fairly um, egotistical for a lack of better word. If someone's having a bad day, they might be inadvertently behaving like this and not recognize it at all. You may go up to this manager and say these things and they might say, you know what, I'm having a really rough day and I didn't realize I was behaving like that and I'm sorry. So. When you're having this interaction, just be mindful of that neutral language and hear them out. You know, see if there's a simpler solution here. That may not always be the case, but you should at least say, I recognize that this behavior is happening and we probably need to do something different when we're interacting going forward. I'm going to skip our scenario about the movie since we didn't get to see that but I will go ahead and open this up for some questions. Alicia, one question that I have, you had mentioned earlier in your presentation that you should remove yourself. What if you are in a situation where you are unable to physically remove yourself? So that's a wonderful question. When you're dealing with something like that, I would say just giving yourself space. If it's a large enough place where you can maybe just move away from the person or just in saying to the person you're in conflict with, I need a few minutes to regroup. You know, I think I'm just going to step over here or I'm going to, you know, just step away from you for a few moments. Um, so even if you can't get enough physical space, you're at least kind of separating yourself from the interaction in that moment. 
And thank you. And I would remind everyone, thank you for your patience in our technical difficulties with the chat box we are experiencing. But you can put a question in the question and answer section, and we will get to those. Another question while we have a few minutes, Alicia, is can you tell us a real case study? maybe something that you experienced yourself or someone in your division experienced that has brought this issue to the forefront? Absolutely. So this training was unfortunately developed because of a negative interaction that happened in an establishment. Um, <clears throat> The general scenario was that we were doing kind of an in-depth um, an in-depth inspection of the facility. We were doing some on-site listeria testing, which the facility was not familiar with that process. They felt very uneasy about what I was doing. And um, instead of asking me what I was doing, the plant, started texting the regular inspector, just really not appropriate things. Like you need to get a lawyer, you're out to get us and we've caught you. Just, it was just a really negative situation. And in talking to the normal inspector and kind of talking to the area supervisor, it came to our attention that this particular interaction was something that had been building for a long time between the inspector and the facility. And so we decided we needed to get some different tools in our toolkit for people to recognize when inappropriate behavior was happening, understanding um, conflict, specifically that passive aggressive conflict and just making sure that my inspectors feel like they're supported and that if they don't feel safe, that they understand what our bureau's policy is to keep them safe while they're working. Thank you. We just received a question and they asked if what you should do if someone is impaired, and I'm assuming by impaired, they're meaning maybe a substance abuse issue? Okay, certainly. So if you're dealing with someone who is impaired, um, and I guess I don't know the background of everyone that's in the audience today. Um, my background is obviously in food safety and food regulation. So um, we wouldn't expect that we would be dealing with impaired people um, probably ever. You know, if we had a plant where there was an impaired employee, we'd probably bring it to the plant's attention and say, you know, this might not be safe. You might want this person to leave. But I would say when you have someone who is impaired by some type of substance, you know, removing yourself from the situation is really the appropriate answer there because um, they're not going to be in a state of mind where de-escalation is probably going to work. Um, if you're in a profession where you have to regularly deal with people who are inebriated, um, I unfortunately would encourage you to reach out to some different resources because that's just, it's not something I deal with um, professionally. Thank you. Also, let's talk about if someone is new and they're going out inspecting for the very first time. What is your advice to them when they might even be a little nervous by inspecting for the first time? Absolutely. So when I have new staff out in the field, um, I first want to set them up for success. Say, if you're needing questions answered right away, here's your call down list. Here's the people who have committed to being available to you. Um, I don't necessarily encourage them to say, hey, I'm brand new and I'm not sure what I'm doing. But if they see something that they're not sure about, I usually just have them make the default comment of, I need to step outside for a moment and make a phone call. And that way they can, you know, kind of separate themselves, get information, get advice. Um, and even when they're a little more experienced saying something like, I'm not familiar with this situation. 
I think I need to get some more information about it before we can determine if there's, you know, a concern here or not. I don't think there's anything wrong in being honest when we need more information. And sometimes just asking really open-ended questions can kind of lead us to whether or not there's a problem. Say, um, can you explain more about what you're doing right now? Can you tell me what process you're working on right now? Um, and that can kind of help give us some context clues as well. So those, I think, are great ways to kind of help a new inspector um, kind of navigate that when they're not certain. And I think a really big piece of being a new inspector, too, is taking ownership if you do make a mistake. If you write a violation and you ask your boss to follow up on it and the boss says, no, that wasn't really it say, go back to that plant and own it, right? Go back to that emotional intelligence and say, I misunderstood this regulation. I apologize for that. This is how we're gonna, you know, I, I understand it now. Thank you for understanding. Thank you. We have several more questions. This next question is what about hearing impairment or language barriers or something else that might not be getting recognized and is further impacting the situation? Absolutely. So within our organization, we do have a limited English proficiency plan. Um, so that includes not just foreign languages, but also things like people who have a hearing impairment or have a speaking disability. Um, so for those situations, I would encourage program managers and HR to make sure that your staff know what your limited English proficiency program is. And if you don't have one, I would certainly encourage people to develop it. If something is happening right in the moment where there's a significant language barrier and you recognize that, you know, if you're able to say as simply as possible, I think we need assistance to talk um, or try to write that down or however you can get that statement across and then leaning on that policy for limited English proficiency is my advice for that. Thank you. Another question that just came in is what if someone starts in with personal name calling, such as if you if they accuse you of being a racist, for example? So like we kind of talked about during that moment of coming back together, we have limitations on when we deescalate, right? So accusing people of things, name calling, yelling, those are non-starters. So if someone says, well, you know what? You're just racist. You say, you know what? I'm sorry. I don't think this is a productive conversation in this context. Um, we can follow up later or I will send you my inspection findings later. And if you would like to sit down and talk about it, you know, the next time I'm here, we can do that. Um, you know, we're not like I said, that kind of back and forth, you're a racist, no, I'm not, that's not going to help de-escalate it. So if someone's starting in with accusations, that's a pretty good sign that this de-escalation isn't going to be productive in that moment. You guys definitely need to break away for a while and try to come back to it. We have another question that came in here and it says, I love the idea of having a written policy about dealing with an aggressive operator. When you mention having written SOPs for inspection staff to return to the facility, what does that look like? Okay, so for the program that I manage, we are under um, the USDA's we, we match the USDA's laws, essentially. So how it works for us is if something happens, the inspector is expected to leave. They're going to write down what happened. They're going to call their supervisor and say, I had to leave. This is what went down. And then their written statement comes to me. I evaluate it and... If it's something that I think just warrants a warning, I may write a letter to that operator, remind them of the regulation and say, hey, remember, we have this policy in place. You want us here so that you can put the mark of inspection on your products. We expect you to treat our employees you know, professionally and respectfully. If it's beyond that, if it's something that's more serious, 
we actually suspend our services. We will not be there for them to put the mark of inspection on their product. And we make the plant come up with their written policy on how they're going to address this. So um, the letter that I use says, you need to identify what happened, which kind of forces them to take ownership of their role in the altercation. And then we say, what will you do to make sure this doesn't happen again? And they will send us a written response back. And we either say, yes, you know, that's acceptable or no, you know, that's, that doesn't adequately address what happened here. Once they have an accepted plan, we have a verification checklist that we use for 90 days afterwards. And the inspector checks that checklist off every day. So example ones might be, um, this employee will not talk to the staff. You know, if there's something going on, they will get the owner and ask the owner to talk to them. Or another one that I've seen is, you know, the employees of the plant will not, you know, say anything to the staff unless the inspector asks a question about what they're doing, or they will be professional towards the staff. So there's a lot of different um, ways that they can kind of meet that metric, but we do put the onus on the establishment to recognize what needs to be changed. Um, a recent one that we had was that the plant actually made all of their employees watch like a harassment training video and they all had to sign off and say they understood what harassment was. Thank you. We have another individual who is asking if you could go back to the slide that has the final thoughts on it, the closing thoughts. Can you flip back to that so we can look at that in a little more detail? Sure. All right, there we go. So that is up. We have about five minutes left. So if anyone has any more questions, please put them in. I see that we have one now. And it is, if there appears to be unresolved conflict between an inspector and workers in the past, how do you recommend the inspector conduct future inspections, at what point should the inspector be switched with another colleague for safety? So this is a wonderful question. And this is one that is certainly challenging. So um, I generally, when I have an employee who's identifying that something's not going well at the plant, you know, I try to sit down to, with the inspector first and say, do you have any ideas about you know, what's going on here? Did you maybe have a day in the past where you had to take enforcement action and it wasn't handled well? Um, you know, can you think of any reason why this might be happening? And that kind of drives a lot of the decision-making process after that. Um, in a situation that I've had recently, it sounds like, unfortunately, my inspector's conduct at the time was not exactly appropriate. Um, they didn't assault anyone, but their word choice and how they talked about the violation was received pretty badly. And the plant had a lot of resentment towards that individual for behaving that way. And so once I've kind of finessed that out, usually what I will do is reach out to the owner myself and say, it's come to my attention that this has happened. Um, and I've talked about the issue with the inspector. These are the steps my inspector has committed to following going forward. Can you assure me that that will sufficiently resolve this? Um, and sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. I have in rare cases removed the inspector from the plant permanently, um, but I do have reservations when I make that decision because we're pretty remote up here in Montana. It's not always the easiest thing just to swap someone out because of the geography of our plants. And I also don't really want to send the message to the establishment of, 
oh, if you think someone's, you know, too hard or you just don't like someone, you can complain and kind of keep cycling through inspectors until you get someone that maybe is, you know, not as harsh on me or is easier to deal with. So we certainly don't try to give the plants the impression that they have control over who's inspecting them. So it's a tricky, um, it's a tricky way to navigate that for sure. That makes sense. And that is all the questions that we have in our chat box. So Alicia, I want to thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us this afternoon. And thank all the participants who took an hour out of their busy day. And again, we would ask that you fill out the survey if you can get into the chat box. And again, we apologize for the technical difficulties. What we will do is we will send you all the registered attendees a record of this webinar. So if you did miss anything or have any other additional questions, you can reach back out to us. Alicia, any closing words for us this afternoon? I just want to thank everyone so much for attending this. I hope you found value in this. And just remember that conflict is part of life, but now you have the tools to hopefully address it with a game plan. Thank you. And again, thank you all the attendees for joining us this afternoon. And we hope you have a wonderful and productive rest of your afternoon and evening. Thank you very much. Bye bye. We still have several people still signing off. So since we had issues with the chat, Jordan, who is absolutely wonderful on our Margaret department, she is going to send the survey along with the email with a recording. So everyone will be able to have that. She just put that into the chat. Somebody mentioned it would be interesting to see the distribution of professionals and that the link is working in the chat. Did you see in the chat, someone uh, put in, is it helpful to try to explain the consequences if I could not finish the inspection? I think that that certainly can be um, a good way to address it, but you need to be careful in how you go about it. If you say, if you don't straighten up, this is over, and you won't get inspected today, that certainly won't help. But if you say something like, I need to do my work today, 
if this continues, I'm going to have to leave and we'll have to resume this at a later time. So I think if you can frame it in a non-confrontational way, that certainly can be helpful, but you do need to use some caution. You know, throwing out consequences with force certainly can escalate things instead of de-escalate. I'm seeing that there are still 36 participants in. Shazad, should we just close it? Yeah, if you're comfortable with that, we can totally, um, I can click end. Um, and if you want to, Christy, um, I can call you about some of the difficulties <laughs> on Teams. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and close it? Okay. Can you, myself, and Alicia stay on and we can have that conversation? Or does it not work that way? Oh, we'll have to do it through Teams. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and end this now. Okay. Thank you. Thank well, Alicia, one thing I noticed at one point, I don't know if it's the highest point or not, I'm asking. Um, we had 182 individuals Ooh. participating so wow That's i think fantastic. you should be very happy with uh, your <laughs> attendance that's mm -hmm. wonderful <laughs> and then let's stay in communications about the aec and then i'll have this conversation with sharad um and we'll go from there Perfect. okay, thank okay. You. That sounds great thank you so much okay thank Bye -bye. you